Senadores y uh, los miembros y amigos del Consejo, uh, muchas gracias por su invitación de estoy aquí uh, hoy. Es un honor especial por yo. Uh, este Consejo es muy uh, pre prestigioso. Uh, gracias por su cooperación también con la uh, Embajada de Irlanda. Uh, tenemos un instituto en Irlanda uh, de European y International Relaciones, uh, ojalá puedes desarrollar una conexión estratégica como los dos países y gracias por su ayuda eh, con eso. Eh, ahora lo siento, voy a hablar en inglés porque eh, no tengo las palabras por uh, este discurso. Uh, my apologies for that. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It is an honor for me. I might have just at the, at the outset say thank you very much for the very warm reception that I have received as a a representative of my government on our, our national feast day of St. Patrick. Um, to see the celebrations, to see the crowds was, was, was very, very special. It's particularly special for me because I do have a family connection with Argentina. And I've been telling everyone who I've met, so apologies if you've heard this very brief story, but um, in 1880, my great-great-grandfather arrived in Argentina and went to Córdoba. And there, with a few other people, they established the town of La Bulaja. Um, and the family is still there, but my great-grandmother returned to Ireland at about 1915. Um, and so the family split into two lines. Um, but today the family still live in La Village, and uh, my cousin lives here in White <coughs> Um So always in my family there has been a very strong connection with Argentina. And so I was very excited to be able to come here uh, for this very important day for our country as a representative of our government, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about Brexit, and I'm going to try and, and say something you haven't heard before, but that's probably impossible, because people have read and spoken so much about Brexit, um, what more is there to say? But I, I begin with a quote from Voltaire. Voltaire said that doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty is absurd. And throughout the Brexit process to date, we have been filled with much uncertainty. Um, much uncertainty as to what might happen. And through that, to try and manage that uncertainty, we have placed a very high value on order, on stability, and on process. A long process that is now perhaps coming to a conclusion. Not of the entire process, but perhaps of the first stage in that process. The first question I think we have to ask is, what is Brexit? What, what does it mean? Um, is it the natural progression, in terms of a linear progression, from the moment the UK entered the European Union, uh, was it always likely that it would one day leave because of the way in which it entered the European Union, and because of the way that, for many, many years, the English press represented the European Union to the European people? Was this something that was, to an extent, inevitable? Or is it a paradigm shift? Is it something different altogether that could not have been anticipated? Is it a, a reaction to wider forces, globalization, migration, technology, job disruption, uh, part of something bigger? Um, and we saw in the same year as Brexit other elections taking place. And if it is part of something bigger, is that something bigger? Is it actually a shift? Is it something that meaningful? Or is it just a momentary reaction to changes in communication, things like fake news? Um, or was it just an accident? Was it something that wasn't meant to happen? but because of the way it was managed, bad planning, it did happen. It's very difficult to know today, because we are so close to the event, what it actually means. Um, certainly, if it was a, a mistake, bad planning on the part of the authorities who led the process, um, then our concerns should not be so great in terms of the wider impact. If it was something that was perhaps inevitable because the UK um, press or public were not comfortable with their membership of the European Union, then it is something that is, again, perhaps more particular to the United Kingdom. But if it represents a broader shift, a bigger shift, in terms of a change that is happening perhaps in other countries around the world, uh, either as a reaction to migration or a reaction to the fact that we are living through a technological revolution, then every other country must study it very carefully and must, in their own countries, and indeed the other countries in the European Union, must ask themselves, then I think, some more important questions. Um, to make sure that they, uh, or we, are prepared for possible dramatic changes in our own countries or in other parts of the world. But as I said, 
it is too soon to, to actually know. And so we have to prepare, I believe, in many ways for the worst case scenario. Yeah, because this is happening and it is real, even though and in our conversation um, earlier, it, it seems unreal, it seems impossible. But of course, we have seen in every stage of, of, of I think, the Brexit negotiations, what we thought was impossible quickly become impossible. Um, it is true to say, though, that when it came to the particular challenge of the United Kingdom deciding to leave the European Union, that this was going to be a significant challenge for the European Union itself, but a challenge also for my own country. For the European Union, for the first time in its relatively short but very successful history, a member state had chosen to leave. Um, and I think there is no doubting the success of the European Union. Uh, a group of nations coming together on a, uh, in a part of the world that was only uh, forged in conflict, and forged in war, now coming together to forge something in peace and harmony. And it has done that, and it has achieved that. It has achieved more than that. Because not only has it achieved peace and harmony, it has achieved prosperity. Though there have been difficult times, of course there have been with the recession that European countries experienced um, about 10 years ago. Because of that commonality, because of the union, we were able to help each other out of those difficult times. So a very, very successful project. And yet, in 2016, uh, the United Kingdom chose to leave. So a difficult challenge for the European Union to reflect itself on what that means. But for Ireland, perhaps a more practical challenge for many, many reasons which you will no doubt be aware. But just to summarize them briefly, in the first instance, ourselves in the United Kingdom joined the European Union together. So within the European Union, we have a shared identity, both English-speaking countries, and the only two English-speaking countries really, um, both common law jurisdictions. Uh, again, unique in the European Union, and both working together to similar interests because of our geographic location, but also because of our historical and cultural association as well. And so for us, in, as Ireland operates within the European Union, we have lost a, a close partner. And that will create challenges for us as we negotiate the institutions. And I'll come back to how we address those challenges a little later. We also, ourselves in the United Kingdom, have a, a common travel area that predates our membership of the European Union. And this is about more than just traveling between the two islands. It's actually the right to live and work and receive support in each other's countries. And it is there since Ireland separated from the United Kingdom and became its own independent country. And so it's a very important relationship um, that is vital to both economies, but also both societies as well. The third area in which we have a very close association um, is, of course, Northern Ireland. So we are now the only country, once the United Kingdom leaves the EU, that will have a land border um, with uh, the United Kingdom. And we have a, a shared responsibility for Northern Ireland, and a shared responsibility, of course, for the peace process. Um, many, many years it took between our two governments to be able to build up a peace that would last, a meaningful peace. And we need to work together, to continue to work together, to make sure that peace continues in Northern Ireland. Um, and in the last number of years, separate to the relationship that we have had over Northern Ireland, the relationship between our two governments has become incredibly strong, thanks to the visit of the Queen of England in 2011, and the great work that she did in one week to move both our countries on for many, many years. Um, as I have said before, uh, it won't change certain facts. We still won't cheer for the English rugby team, um, but that's okay. Uh, sport is a, is, a, is a field where we can still have a healthy competition. But these are the very, very intrinsic things to our relationship with the United Kingdom, very real and practical things that have made their decision to leave the European Union more challenging for us, and we believe, than any other country in the European Union. And we have spent almost four years now dealing with this particular challenge, and it wasn't our policy decision. So while it will create challenges, of course, for other countries in the world that do significant trade with the UK, and a lot of that trade depending on its membership of the European Union, for Ireland, the challenges go beyond trade and they go into every fabric of Irish society. And so, four years ago, and we commenced a year before the referendum, we began our strategy to prepare for uh, the UK leaving the EU. And the strategy is basically across four strands. The first area of that strategy was to investigate every aspect of our economy and our society, which would be altered by the fact that the UK would leave the EU. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but over decades of membership together in the European Union, 
so many fundamental things about our laws, um, about the way our society, our communities, and our economy operate, had become part of European legislation. Um, joint funding programs for Northern Ireland for peace and for education now being administered through the European Union. Our agricultural economy, all our violent economy, that didn't recognize the fact that we were actually two different jurisdictions. Our electricity market, the same. Um, so many people traveling back and forth between Northern Ireland and the Republic every day, or between London and Dublin every day in other parts of the country. So we had to look at all of this one year before the referendum to make sure that if there was uh, a negative vote, if they did vote to leave, that we would be prepared, but we hoped it wouldn't happen. But thanks to that early preparation, um, we were more than ready for the decision that was taken. And in fact, the work that we had done helped with the Commission and other EU partners to understand the challenges that they would face as well. The other element of our preparations in terms of our strategy was to put Ireland at the center of the EU negotiations, to make sure that as the negotiating team from the European Union that would represent all of the remaining 27 member states went forth into those negotiations with the United Kingdom, that they understood the particular difficulties that we had, that the European Union understood the need and the importance of maintaining peace on the island of Ireland. And the European Union believed and defended the fact that there should not be a return to a border in Ireland. And that was very important to us. And it was very important that our partners in the European Union, Union recognized uh, these, these kind of fundamental truths as we saw to any negotiation. The other aspect, the other strand to our, our, our strategy was to diversify our markets for export. Trading so much with the United Kingdom in certain areas, particularly in agriculture, for example, we needed to make sure that in the event of withdrawal, um, that it would be more difficult to access certain markets, that we need to improve our access to other markets abroad. And so a lot of work began in that area. And the fourth strand of our strategy to deal with the United Kingdom leaving the European Union and as important as any other strand, and perhaps more important, was to make sure that the Irish people's belief in the Union, belief in this project, remained strong. That is, they didn't start to have the kinds of doubts that we saw in the United Kingdom, or the kinds of difficulties uh, that people expressed. And that was part of protecting ourselves from what might be a, a bigger and more worrying trend across the world, a retreat from international relations, a retreat from um, from trade relationships, a retreat from community and to more inward looking um, policy. And so we have put in place a very ambitious program to make sure that we can protect the view of the European Union uh, in Ireland. And on each of those four strands of the strategy, I think we have been successful today, as successful as you can be, despite the fact that we continue to live in uncertain times. For example, the preparations that we did across each aspect of our society and our economy led to us creating legislation which was passed by our parliament a number of weeks ago to prepare us for a no-deal scenario, um, the worst possible type of exit where there will be exit without an agreement. I will return, unfortunately, early from this trip uh, to Argentina because we have another cabinet meeting of the government to agree new financial measures that have been prepared over the last number of months and years to help different sectors of society that will need financial help in the event of a no-deal scenario. If we look at another part of the strategy, how do the Irish people feel about our membership of the European Union? Well, in fact, in the last number of years, it has only gotten stronger and stronger. And today, almost every poll will show that support for the public, popular public support for the European Union, is over 90%, which is incredible. It is perhaps the highest than in any other European country. So we have made sure that at every step of the way, as we deal with this challenge, we're also talking about the positive things the European Union has done for our people, and the people can really see that. It was traditionally perhaps something easy for politicians to do in every country, and in Ireland, that when there was a difficult decision or something went wrong, to blame the European Union. Irresponsible, easy, and sometimes politicians act that way. Um, and I'm, as a politician, I'm not pretending I don't either, but we have been more mature in our relationship with the European Union mature in our relationship with the public and explain to them why the European Union is a force for good and why we want to remain a part of it and that has been successful in our country. In relation to diversifying our markets, that has proven successful as well but we still have a way to go. We very recently opened up um, for the first time after long negotiations our markets, our beef markets into China which is proving very, very successful. 
and we have the EU trade agreement with Japan, which is going to be very important to us, we believe. And also, even though the UK leaving the EU is a, is a, is a big negative, we have looked for small positives, and in financial services in particular, we've been able to attract in uh, more global entities to use Dublin and Ireland as its base and gateway into the European Union as an English-speaking country, as a common <coughs> jurisdiction in which most financial services operate, no longer having the UK as a, as a gateway, Ireland has positioned itself as that gateway instead. And in the last area, which is in relation to making sure our concerns were at the centre of the EU's concerns, we did achieve that in terms of the uh, negotiations led by Michel Barnier, in that um, the Northern Ireland question was one of the three key strands of those negotiations. Those negotiations came to a successful conclusion with the withdrawal agreement. And I say successful because the withdrawal agreement was agreed by both the European Union, each of its member states, as well as the government of the United Kingdom. And in that withdrawal agreement, uh, there was a commitment, a joint commitment, from the United Kingdom and from the European Union that there would not be a hard border in Northern Ireland, that we would protect the peace process that had been built, that we would respect the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement that protect that, that peace, that allow us to build that peace. And more than that, the withdrawal agreement include an insurance policy, a backstop, to make sure that though negotiations might take some time and negotiations on the future agreement might be difficult, that no matter what happened, um, we would not find ourselves in a position where there would be any risk of imposing a border on Northern Ireland, any risk to the disruption of the very uh, strong relationship that we have, any risk to the disruption that we have between our two markets, the, the common travel area as well. And we had that in place and we made sure that was put in place with the intention of never having to use it. Um, you know, again, an insurance policy, a backstop, the last stop, not the first stop, but the last stop. Because we had, between the backstop, uh, as a next level up, the a possibility of other arrangements that could be negotiated uh, to prevent the need for any type of border or any disruption between uh, north and south of Ireland. And of course, what we had primarily was, with a withdrawal agreement, the opportunity to enter into a transition period to then negotiate our future relationship. That's where we want to be, talking about the future relationship and the close relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. And yet still here we are, focusing on the withdrawal period, not yet able to get into substantive negotiations on that next relationship. And what we've witnessed over the past few months is an attempt by Prime Minister May to get the withdrawal agreement through the UK Parliament, and that has been incredibly difficult. Uh, not least because of the fact that um, there is not a, a single majority in the Parliament and present for any particular outcome. And so what we've seen um, in the last few weeks is, is something quite incredible. And, and to come back to another quote that I've been using quite a bit over the last number of months is a quote from Lenin, where he said that there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. And we are experiencing those weeks with Brexit all the time. And last week was one such week. And last week was one of those weeks of kind of high diplomatic activity, where all of a sudden on a Monday, um, Prime Minister May went to travel to Europe to meet with President Juncker because two new documents had been agreed between the European Union and the United Kingdom, and a third document, a unilateral statement, had also been drafted by the United Kingdom. And the expectation of the Prime Minister and of the, of the European Union was that these three additional layers of interpretation of the withdrawal agreement would give sufficient support to those people who were worried uh, about things like the backstop, that these additional layers of interpretation would allow there to be a consensus in the Parliament to agree the withdrawal agreement and to move to the next stage of negotiations. Um, we saw the press conference with May and Duncan um, that did not, that was a successful press conference and that there was agreement clearly between the two principles. But unfortunately then we saw that the Attorney General of the UK Parliament could not um, give his full support to the agreement in the way that was hoped. And then we went into a process of three votes. The first vote was another vote against the withdrawal agreement, unfortunately. The vote the next day was to reject a no-deal scenario, which absolutely very welcome from the European Union and Ireland's point of view, however not legally binding on the government, and not a, um, a foolproof way of avoiding a no-deal. And the third vote was a yes to an extension. Again welcome, given where we are in terms of the time, the timing in relation to Brexit. But then we begin this week expecting another meaningful vote, 
and possibly a successful one with a request for an extension at the end of the week. And yet yesterday we see from the Speaker of the House that um, he will not facilitate another meaningful vote for reasons of precedent in the English Parliament that go back to almost its foundation. We have a European summit in two days, uh, a summit at which we are potentially going to receive a request for an extension. But it's not yet clear if we definitely will. And while we have said that we are always open to considering an extension, it's very important for us to know, well, how long is the extension for? And what is the reason for the extension? And two different time horizons have been spoken about. One would be a three-month extension, a short extension, for technical reasons. One would assume because there was agreement, or potentially agreement around the withdrawal, the withdrawal agreement, which would then take a couple of weeks to be fully ratified by Parliament, in which case then we would then enter into our transition period uh, a couple of months after the end of March deadline. The other time horizon is the 21-month time horizon, and that is in the anticipation that something more significant would need to happen in the UK, but also recognising that the European Union has its own uh, own issues to deal with in a particular time period, and that 21-month period would be more helpful to the European Union side of the table. And in all of this now, in this week, um, we still have the threat of a no-deal hanging over us, because if an extension is not sought, um, or if an extension is sought but cannot be agreed in time. Um, we only have a matter of days. And what we have tried to do, again, coming back to my initial point, given all the uncertainty, we have put a huge amount of value uh, and importance in process, in order, in stability of the process and the order. And one of the things that we have not wanted to have is on the last day, at the last hour, people in a room trying to get together and agree with an imperfect agreement. When we have spent two years a very robust withdrawal agreement that is just the first stage of what we believe can be a very positive um, negotiation to a future relationship with the United Kingdom. That's where we want to be. And so it's very difficult to know what's going to happen over the next few days. Um, and it's very difficult. We will have our own emergency cabinet meeting um, in, in Dublin tomorrow. We will agree additional financial measures that have been prepared over the last number of months. The Taoiseach, our Prime Minister, will then travel to the summit and we will then um, hopefully have a proposition from the UK Prime Minister and we'll be able to consider it then. And, I mean, to be clear, people watching the process might say, well, look, an extension is absolutely a positive thing, no matter what it is or what it is for, even if it's an extension that is sought without some certainty around it. And an extension obviously being a way of, a deal, of avoiding a, a, a no deal, a crash out at the end of this month. And I understand that, that logic, of course I do. But at the same time, the EU cannot continue to go on indefinitely in this process because there are difficulties for the EU as well. Not to mention, you know, we have the elections of the European Parliament at the end of May. Uh, towards the end of the year, we will have the new commission to be appointed. And we also have to agree new budgetary terms for the next financial cycle for the European Union. So all of these practical reasons, we need to have a proper understanding of uh, the UK's position in terms of its exit from the European Union, but also we need to have been able to have begun to understand well, what the future relationship will look like. And separate to those very practical issues around the, the difficulties that a request for an extension will pose, even though we're open to them, is the, the bigger question of the European Union and what it has to do. We have other challenges, other than Brexit, that we have to, to deal with. We have other things that we want to do. Agreements with the Mercosur countries, for example, that we would like to progress. Um, you know, so there are all these other things that, because of the Brexit decision, we have not been able to give enough attention to, um, that we need to refocus our attention on. And of course, with an extension, of course, with an agreement on withdrawal, we then move into the negotiation phase. Of course, we do, but we do so with the safety net of a transition period, we do so with the safety net of a withdrawal agreement, and we do so, um, you know, we move to then a positive phase, I think, of discussions, which I think would always be welcome. So these are the challenges that we face um, right now, right at this moment, this week in the European Union. Very important time for the Union. And, and again, it, because we're so close to it in history, it's difficult to fully understand the, the implications of it. Just to conclude, um, I want to touch upon Ireland's role um, in the world separate from the European Union because 
while Brexit has caused us its own immediate challenges and it's taken up much of our time, much of our focus as a country, we are a country that's undergone quite significant change in the last 10 years. And we have a new Prime Minister now, a new government since 2017. And we have very strong ambitions um, for our, our country, but also for, for, for the globe. And in, in, in part, the ambitions that we have are, they're not a reaction to Brexit, but they certainly help with the Brexit challenge. They are more a reaction, again, to those global events that we may be witnessing where countries are turning more to domestic policy, turning more in on themselves, uh, retreating from trade, retreating from this idea of working together um, to help everyone. And so in the election campaign for the new prime minister, he said that he wanted to put Ireland as an island at the center of the world. And through our diaspora, through the many Irish communities, because of our history of immigration, we have people all over the world. And indeed, my engagement here at St. Patrick's Day is part of our ambition to strengthen those communities, and in strengthening those communities, strengthen our relationship with their host countries and their host governments to see how we can work together. So we are at a time of rapid diplomatic expansion in Ireland, where we are doubling our global footprint. Through our embassies, and we've just opened a new embassy in Santiago and in Magotta as well, um, but also then through things like more trade missions, more trade investment, bringing together not just our embassies, but our international development agencies, our international enterprise agencies, our tourism board, our, our agricultural agencies, into what we call the, the um, Ireland House Model. One building, one location in a city, in a country, where we can then work together ourselves as a country to then work into that host country as well. It's proven very successful. We'll also have a new strategy for Latin America launched later in the year, which will use Argentina as, a, as an anchor, as a key foothold in the region. Uh, to, to improve our relations here and to improve um, the trade that we have. We're also very, very positive about the potential that the Mercosur EU trade agreement has for both parts of the world. Um, it will be about four times the size of the trade relationship that we've agreed with Japan, and that was the most significant to date. It will be absolutely huge, and a huge opportunity for both Argentina and for the European Union if we can come to a successful conclusion to those negotiations. And then separate to that as well, Separate to us placing ourselves at the centre of the European Union and the European Union at the centre of Ireland. Separate to us expanding, doubling our global footprint through our Global Ireland 2025 vision. We also want to be at the centre of the United Nations as well. And um, actually the badge that I have is the symbol of our campaign for membership of the United Nations Security Council in 2021 and 2022. Every 20 years or so, Ireland has had membership of the Security Council. Um, and we believe that we have played a very responsible role working to our own values in human rights, in disarmament, and in peacekeeping. Um, values that we have shared with the United Nations and we have worked hard for in the United Nations and lost our um, soldiers to in, in, in defending uh, parts of the world on behalf of the United Nations. So we're very proud of the role that we've played and we want to play a role again in 2021 and 2022 as part of this, uh, this new ambition to increase cooperation and increase and our work together as a global community. It's very, very important for us. Um, and on that point, I would just like to conclude, um, because what I've seen in, in my uh, engagements in Argentina, it's been a very short visit, too short, and I do want to come back for another visit, is, I think, an opportunity for two parts of the world that are uh, very separate in terms of distance, but very close in so many other ways. If there are opportunities for us to strengthen our relationship, for the, both countries to work together on the global stage to improve things for every other country that we can through commercial relationships, through uh, strengthening institutions, institutions like this. At the beginning of my uh, presentation, in my um, inadequate Spanish, I spoke about the institute that we have that's very similar to this at home, the IIEA. And it's very, very important that institutions like the IIEA and institutions like this very prestigious council are talking to each other uh, and discussing the same issues. And more important than that, finding a way for how we get the very important discussions that we have here out into the wider world in a meaningful way so people uh, can understand the complexity of the things that we're trying to do. Uh, the, the technological revolution that we're going through at the moment has tried to reduce everything to simplicity. 140 characters in a tweet 
people won't watch more than 30 seconds of a video. The world is more complex than that. International relations are more complex and more important than that. But if we don't find a way of communicating to the general public um, about these important issues, then we will lose them. And we, will, we will see more things like Brexit and other types of decisions by the public in that vein. We have fought very hard to help people understand uh, the European Union and Ireland, and it has worked. But we need to do much more than that when it comes to things like welcoming people into our own country, taking migrants from parts of the world where they cannot find safety and security in their own lives, um, and also recognizing that while trade agreements and technology do disrupt and do damage and destroy jobs, they can also create other jobs as well, and they can also help um, parts of our own country and parts of the world achieve a type of prosperity and security that they haven't seen perhaps ever. Um, so I really, really do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, uh, and I look forward to the questions that you may have. Thank you.